What's poppin', y'all? Welcome back to another episode of the Heliocentric Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Pierre, Pee Wee the Plug, Andreessen. In today's episode, we got to talk about the current state of the Golden State Warriors, Chet Holmgren and the Red Hot Oklahoma City Thunder, and a few players I would like to see traded and going on to new situations along with a bunch of other things around the league. Before we dive into that, though, I just want to remind everybody at home, make sure you hit that like button for me. And if you're new and you enjoy this type of content, make sure you subscribe for my YouTube and I Audio listeners, if you can, please head over to wherever you get your podcasts and leave this podcast a five star like and review. I definitely appreciate it. And I want to say happy holidays to everybody. Hope everybody have fun. Great, happy, safe Thanksgiving. So shout out to y'all and enjoy the holidays with y'all fam for basketball. Let's start Golden State. I think I talked about Golden State on the last podcast, mostly about the struggles. They're continuing to struggle. We definitely talked about the Draymond Green situation and whatnot. This current state that they're in is a little bit bittersweet, right? Um, I'm not going to lie. This is a team that I definitely, I don't want to say rooted against, but there was a time when Golden State (laughs) had the NBA in a chokehold, right? They had a 73-win season. Um, They lost in the finals. Obviously, the 3-1 comeback was amazing for basketball and the sport. And they went out and they signed Kevin Durant. And that team, you know, was on steroids to win 73 games and then also add a Kevin Durant after losing to Harrison Barnes. It had the basketball world in a chokehold and they became dominant and they had already started a dynasty. This was like the cherry on top of an amazing dynasty. And I remember being like, man, as a fan, I just want to see Goliath go down. It had nothing to do with the players. It had nothing to do with being anti-Warriors because they played a great brand of basketball. We obviously all love the stories of Klay Thompson, Steph Curry, Draymond being a second-round pick, Eagle Dalla fitting into a role off the bench, Steve Kerr coming in and taking this team that was basically uh, just all right and making them just just amazing team, you know, just one of the best starts of a coaching career that we have ever seen. And the Kevin Durant move to a lot of us made us scratch our head. We called it weak and a lot of different things. But after a while, it was kind of like, you know, he did fit that situation and system so well that it was kind of hard to blame him. But as a fan, there was an intrigue in seeing if a team could come together and beat this juggernaut of a team. And I say all that to say that they had one of the most remarkable dynasties, right, where it was kind of polarizing, where you love to kind of hate them. There was this. There was this disdain because they were so good. But at the same time, like I said, they were so beloved because you got guys like Steph Curry, who is just like a proper ambassador of the league, never doing anything wrong. Babyface assassin. He changed the game with the three point shot. The Splash Brothers. Who don't love that or who didn't become a fan of that? Klay Thompson, you know, what I'm saying going to Washington State, not necessarily being his first overall pick. Not that he wasn't a lottery pick, but they kind of just developed and did things in a great way along the way obviously it got shadowed by the Kevin Durant thing but underneath that they were the darlings of the NBA that kind of took it by storm and beneath the hatred that some people had or you know um whatever the downfall that they were preying on you secretly loved and admired what they did and what they built and over all of the years To see them go through everything they went through with the injuries in that finals against the Raptors where Kawhi and those guys took that and the injuries that happened with Kevin Durant and his Achilles, Klay Thompson and his situation, and even the next year with Steph Curry being hurt and they kind of having this down year where Kevin Durant goes to Brooklyn and that was an awkward exit because of him and Draymond. Now everybody else is injured and you have this down year where you're not that good of a team at all. Um, And it turn it just turns into something else, right? It's some some down years. And it's kind of like, man, was that the end? We, we didn't know if that was the end there was them losing Kevin Durant going to be too much for them to recover because now Brooklyn has a team and Giannis is on his way and Phoenix looks real good. LeBron and Anthony Davis, And after a couple of down years and kind of retooling and and, and going into this youth movement direction, they somehow bounced back and won another championship. And they were able to do it without a Kevin Durant. Um, To a lesser degree, they got somebody like Andrew Wiggins who kind of fit more to what they had needed. 
And it wasn't like a star power team, but they went in there and they took their system around their star and they won a championship with some young guys. And that was refreshing. And that was like, whoa, hold up. The dynasty ain't done. It ain't over. This team can still win. This team can still play at a high level. They still can't be counted out because you have Steph Curry and you have this system and you have these young guys who are going to continue to develop and take these monster steps and, you know, the passing of the torch to potentially Jordan Poole and then Draymond can pass the torch to Kaminga and you got Moody who can learn from Clay. James Wiseman could be that big. And very shortly after, obviously, everybody knows the Draymond Green situation happened with the punch. And, you know, at the, some point during that season, they cashed in on James Wiseman and gave up on that project. And we learned today in this season that, not today, but in this season, Draymond was saying that the chemistry just wasn't there. And that was a crazy quote that we all talked about of like, oh, I wonder why that happened. But to see them go through all of that and we still look at them as a team that had hope and to now be on a six game losing streak. In the middle of Draymond Green having another suspension, he's missed two games now, so he has three more games left on that suspension. Clay Thompson doesn't look anything close to Clay Thompson. He doesn't even look like Clay Thompson from last year, let alone Clay Thompson from a couple years ago. Andrew Wiggins, who had an incredible bounce back game um, against OKC the other night, and we hope hope that that puts him on the right track. He's had a very minuscule year. You move on from Jordan Poole. You bring in some veteran leadership and point guard play in Chris Paul. Um, But Jonathan Kaminga and Moses Moody, they've been cool and Kaminga has been better, but it still hasn't been, I think, what you would have wished or have had in mind at this point of his career. What is this, year three, year four? I think year four. Um, And... It just seems like this team is going to eventually run Steph Curry kind into the ground. There's nobody there to alleviate anything. Um, we see in a night, the other night, where he's playing magnificent. He's doing his signature sh- uh, threes where he turns around before it goes in. You even get a stellar big night from Andrew Wiggins, and it's still not enough to beat a young team in OKC at home in overtime. And granted, they play well. Chet made an incredible shot to send it into overtime, but the overtime kind of stood out to me um, where, again, specifically Clay Thompson. It's just it's tough because Clay got to get his mojo back for this team to be dangerous um, to some degree. And he is a shooter. And what shooters like to do and shooters like Clay Thompson, they're going to shoot until they shoot themselves out of it. But at the same time, it's a hard pull push and pull effect because you want clay to shoot and get out of his slump but you only want that if he's going to get out of it if clay is becoming a shell of himself then it's only going to hurt the team with that mentality that he's that he has and it's going to be a very tough situation for the entire organization and it makes sense now why bob myers left and i'm not saying he left solely because of that reason but I do think that Bob Myers saw the foreshadowing of this dynasty having to come to some hard points. And this was going to be one of them. The other hard points was going to have to be to make moves, you know, trading Jordan Poole and moving on from him or not bringing back Draymond Green, Clay Thompson's contract extension, being the person responsible to move on and break up this core potentially after having so much success, it's definitely probably not a situation that Bob Myers wanted to be in. Because you have to remember, when you build up a team like this and you do so much winning, there's so much good that comes with winning. There's so much bonding behind winning. There's so much togetherness and closeness and relationships that you build where you're around each other's families, you're entering each other's homes, you're having certain conversations, and your mind is like, man, we're going to do this for the next 10, 15 years. We're going to always win. Nobody while winning thinks about the time of losing or the end of the dynasty. When you're in the middle of that, all you think about is the next time you're going to taste that champagne, the next time you're going to hoist that trophy. And some of the writings have been on the wall And I truly believe that Bob Myers was able to see it from a distance and say, hey, because of the relationships I've built with these guys, because they're kind of like family, 
I don't really want to be a part of that situation when it hits the inevitable end of the road. And this is that end of the road. And I think it's a good thing for Bob Myers and the Golden State Warriors because now Mike Dunleavy is in that seat. And I do believe they're going to have to make some tough decisions and have some tough conversations now and later. And I said all of that to say that these are the situations where Klay Thompson is struggling between being a shell of himself potentially. And I'm saying this with grace. I'm not saying this to be um, an asshole. I'm not saying this to to trash Klay Thompson. Klay Thompson is one of the most beloved players in the league. And if it was up to any of us, we wouldn't have to have these conversations around Klay at all. Nobody wants to down Klay or, or talk bad about him in any way because he's just such a He's such a great player and he he's always been himself and he's always been authentic and, and just a cool guy. Um, so I, I want to put that out there. But if Clay is becoming a shell of himself, he has to change his mentality. And that's the hardest part about these players entering this situation. We talked a little bit about this with James Harden. Um, there's there's evidence of it with the Carmelo Anthony um, exit in his career, Allen Iverson's exit there's a lot of even Kobe Bryant there's a lot of guys who are so used to being a certain way and playing a certain way that now when they're aging or they're they aren't the same it's hard to tell that to their brain it's hard to communicate and translate that to them because they only know how to play one way Clay Thompson only knows to play with a certain green light that's what made him Clay Thompson so it's going to be hard for the coaching staff the roster, it's going to be uncomfortable as well to try to communicate to him that he can't take certain shots. And I see that in the overtime against OKC. When Klay Thompson took a shot, a three, he missed it. And at the three, I was like, man, damn, why did he shoot that? Then they got the offensive rebound, they threw it to Clay, and he shot another contested one like it was nothing. And those are the shots that he can't really take anymore if this is going to be him. And that's not necessarily why they lost the game, but that part of the game was like engraved in my brain because I see that from Clay a lot over the last year and a lot this year where Clay Thompson takes prime Clay Thompson shots, but he's not producing like prime Clay Thompson right now. The current Clay Thompson we're getting is 40% from the field, 30% from three. He just had a game the other night against OKC. They played them twice. But the first game, I think Klay Thompson shot one of 10. One of 10. That is not Klay Thompson-like. And I think the other game, he shot like, uh, I want to say like th- three of uh, 16 or something. Like he shot another tough night. Three of 10, 14 or something. So he shot like four of 26 or four. Like he shot very bad in these two games against the same team and a young team. And that's kind of been Klay Thompson this year where we're waiting, we're waiting. He's waiting as well. He said certain things like, hey, the first 10 games, I wasn't on this. I wasn't doing that. I'm going to get my swagger back. Um, and it's not looking that way. It's not looking that way. And he's he's coming into a situation where he's about to enter free agency. And the 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 status between him and the Warriors is a question mark for me. It's a question mark for me, and it's going to be a hard conversation for the Warriors to have to have. There's there's fans out there that is talking about potentially making an in-season trade, which is unlike the Warriors. The Warriors don't do that, but that's why it's important to remember that Bob Myers isn't there. Mike Dunleavy runs this team now, so we don't know what Mike Dunleavy does. Bob Myers was a guy that said, hey, we're not going to make those many in-season changes or anything like that. Mike Dunleavy may have to say, hey, we, we're going to make dr- dramatic moves over the course of the season. Then we move on from Klay Thompson, and we already know Andrew Wiggins and his woes. Again, he had a stellar performance against OKC. You hope that that can be the start of a snowball effect of him turning the page and getting back on track because they are going to need him, especially if Klay Thompson isn't giving you what he usually gives you offensively. Not to mention the fact that Klay Thompson, because of the injuries, isn't guarding how old Klay Thompson used to guard. Um, the Draymond Green suspension. We talked about Draymond Green in a situation a little bit, but after that, we found out that it was going to be a five-game suspension, and I think he got lucky. I think it definitely could have easily been 10 games, not just because of the current situation, but because of the previous two games where he was 
bickering and getting into certain verbal altercations, I'll say that possibly and potentially could have led to more. You know, when you're looking at somebody who's constantly being a part of these things, you have to look at them as the common denominator. And he is he is that, you know, throwing out here, technical foul there, verbal altercation there, arguing with the referee here. You look at all these different situations that go on in Golden State and Draymond is the common denominator. So five games to me was light. But it feels like 10 games for the Warriors because it's in the midst of them having this spiral effect of being on a six game losing streak. And the next three games that he's going to be out aren't necessarily easy W's. They're playing against teams that they definitely could win, but they're playing against teams that definitely could beat them. Later on tonight, they play against the Houston Rockets team on the night of a back to back where they just played a late Los Angeles Laker game. And now they're going to play a, another late game on the road against Golden State because of this back to back, because Houston is a young team. This should be a win for Golden State, but because you have no Draymond Green, because Klay Thompson is playing and shooting in a way that's a shell of himself. Because you don't know what you're going to get from Andrew Wiggins. Because nothing major is really coming off that bench as of right now, as far as some scoring punch. This could also be a game that the Golden State Warriors could lose. This is a young, hungry Houston team. Because they don't have the size, Alperin Shingun may he may have a monster night tonight. Because they don't really have consistent scoring, they may not be able to keep up outside of Steph Curry. And because this team, this young team, has been coached and motivated to defend, if they're able to limit Steph Curry at any in any way, just limit him. I'm not saying shut him down, but limit him. This is a game that the Golden State Warriors could lose. Because right now, the state of the Golden State Warriors is looking like, hey, we need Steph Curry to score 30 to have a chance to be in the game. Not to win it. To have a chance to be in it. We just saw a night where him and Wiggins, Wiggins get, yo, the night Wiggins just had against OKC, that's supposed to be a win. When Wiggins is playing like that, making the type of shots he, he made, especially the last one down the stretch that looked like it was going to be the game winner before Chet decided to send it to overtime. When he's giving you those type of performances, those are supposed to be stamped wins. Stamped. That, that Wiggins performance gave you a chance to beat an OKC team. Who is, who is hooping? They're second right now in the Western Conference, but still, they're a young team in themselves, and those are usually signature wins for Golden State. Um, so I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking at that losing streak and I'm wondering when, when can it be ended? When is it going to be ended? You have, um, the Spurs, they're going to play in a couple nights, uh, for the end season tournament. That's definitely a win for them. They can definitely win that game. So I'm, I'm looking at the next three without Draymond and hoping, hoping, hoping that they can, um, they can get some things together right now. They're 14th offensively and they're 16th defensively. Historically, when this team is super, super successful, like NBA final successful, they're dominant on one side of the basketball. Um, they've had dominant defenses with the year they won. They had the second best defense in the NBA, I believe, uh, when they beat the Celtics in the finals. They've had years where they're obviously top 10 offense and top 10 defense. They've had years where they're top 10 offense and right outside of the top 10 for defense. And then, you know. Um, so for them to be middle of the pack and both offense and defense, it's alarming. And the thing isn't about the Warriors necessarily being some bottom feeding team that's going to miss the playoffs or anything like that. It's just the fact that you have a culture and a community built around your organization that's used to winning and competing for championships. And because you have your face of your organization and the history of your organization right now playing in his prime, you still want to win and you want to put winning around him. The Warriors aren't satisfied with making the playoffs. They're not satisfied with a a second round appearance, a conference appearance. This is a championship team that has been built and designed to be accustomed and used to having finals appearances and, and being a contender. Um, and right now they're far from that. They're far from that. They are, they look worse than last year and last year they struggled on the road last year. They made it. And they, to me, they had a better team, but this, this team doesn't look as good as last year. Draymond told us the chemistry might have not been as good last year, but from a talent perspective, I liked what I saw last year more, and I had some some things that I can hold my hat on. And you had the excuse of Wiggins not being there, but 
Wiggins is here now and he's still not really performing at that level. And uh, I don't know if any help is coming through that door. There's no help coming through that door necessarily. So it makes me feel bittersweet that this is the end. I think, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying definitely, but I get the feeling this is the end. I think this potentially could be the last year we see Clay Thompson with this team. Unless they give him a sympathy contract and they just want to keep running it back, running it back, running it back. But I do not think that we're going to see a four-year extension with Clay Thompson at a high price. I don't think he's going to get a Draymond Green type contract unless, you know, it's a lot of basketball less, uh, left. Unless after the All-Star break, this turns into one of the best teams in the NBA and I'm just overreacting. But other than that, if they continue to pay, play on this pace, there'll be a team that'll make it. But there'll be just another regular team and in a dogfight Western Conference where you're going to have to play against the Nuggets. You're going to have to play against the Suns. You're going to have to play against a Thunder team, a Timberwolves team, uh, potentially a Lakers or Clippers team if they get rolling. Uh, a Kings team who's now on a six game winning streak as well. This this could be ugly. This could be ugly. And the Draymond Green contract. I think that might be something they they could potentially regret down the line, depending on how this team retools, if it can retool. I just, I, I don't know. Um, it's just a sad thing because, like I said, Steph Curry is playing an elite way, and it's not really, it's not really effective in an elite way for the team. And you hate to, you hate to see a guy be in that situation because he's thirty five. The way Steph Curry is playing is he's playing like a 28-year-old. So you would love to see him be in a situation with Golden State where they have like at least a swinger's chance, a knockout chance to do something. But I'm telling you right now from everything that I'm seeing, I don't see it at all. I came into the year saying, hey, I respect the Warriors. And based off everything that we know about them, you have to consider them being sneaky. They may fly under the radar here. You might not really you know, talk about them too much because they may not run off with the Western Conference like they historically have done. But I never, I never thought they would be, look like this. I didn't think they would look like this at all. Still missing size, missing scoring outside of Steph. There's no depth. The young guys are still the young guys. And in order for them to win, he might have to put up 40. 30 gives them a chance. 40 is like, hey, we, we can win this game. So um, that's my thoughts on the Warriors. That's my my opinion. I think this is heading into a situation where this is the end. And I think as basketball fans, we should read the writings on the wall. And we should look at every Warriors game for the rest of the season while these three guys and Steve Kerr are together. And we should we should not take it for granted. Because this is really possibly could be it. And before you know it, Clay Thompson is on a different team. <laughs> um, and we're like, man, remember the Warriors? Remember what they used to look like? Remember when those got the splash? But remember, before we know it, it's just that fast and it's gone. And all of those things that we used to think of are just memories. So um, that's why it's bittersweet to me. But like I said, a lot of basketball left. We'll see what happens. I want to pivot and dive into a team that they just played and that they lost to. OKC. OKC, like I said, came and beat them, came back and beat them, hit the shot from Chet, going to overtime. They went in overtime. Um, beat them twice in uh, back-to-back games. And then OKC is on a five-game winning streak before you know it. Now they're second out West, um, and they're they're incredible. And the thing I want to talk about with them is how good they are as a young team. I think that's the, that's the underlying thing that can't be forgotten is how young they are. OKC is an extremely young team. I don't have in front of me the average age of this team, but I know Shea is under 25, Chet is under 25, J-Dub is under 25, Giddy's under 25. Um, their veteran is what, Kenrich Williams. Uh, Lou Dort isn't the oldest guy in the, in the league or anything like that. This is an extremely young team, and I'm extremely impressed with how they're playing. I'm not surprised with how they're playing, but I'm impressed with how they're playing because they're winning on the road. They are six and one on the road. And to me, that is stellar for a young team. You see young teams being able to compete, showing potential, showing flashes. But learning how to close out games is a veteran thing that comes with time and experience. They already have that um, so far. And you saw last night or the other night where a guy like Chet was able to make an incredible shot. Usually, what makes these teams so limited is it's always that one guy where 
you would look at it as a shade, shade, it's shade, it's shade, it's shade, shade, shade. But the way Chet has played, it brings him into a situation where they have more than just shade now. They have another guy who happens to be their center who can catch, turn, and shoot a, a fall away corner three to go into overtime. Like they have that. You look at J Dub and his production, and then they have glue guys like Lou Dort um, and Josh Giddy. The Josh Giddy thing is intriguing to me. Because of Case and Wallace and another great draft pick that they have uh, added to the collection, he's now coming in and playing really well, and he's helping them close out games. And a lot of times you'll see the end games, Josh Giddy isn't on the floor. And because Josh Giddy has a lot of potential and he shows some flashes and he's going to make a lot of money, you have to start looking at OKC as who's going to be the odd man out. And I'm not, I don't want to bring that up to dim this conversation because this is supposed to bring some light and shed some uh says some love on Oklahoma City Thunder but I wonder how they're going to pivot in that situation because this isn't the best Josh Giddy we've seen and it may be because there's a lot more going on now versus him and Shea it's like it's like Shea Chet Jada Giddy some nights Dort some nights Wallace so Giddy is kind of getting lost in a shuffle he's going to be expensive you're not going to lowball him I would definitely be highly surprised if you're able to lowball him Teams are going to be interested. The Thunder are ahead of schedule. Do you take him and try to flip him for an already cemented player that could help you down the line in areas you think you might be weak in because of guard play, you are not weak in. <laughs> um, so that's something that I'm looking at as well with them. But, yeah, I'm just impressed with them. I'm impressed with Chet. Chet has been phenomenal. Um, somebody asked me a while ago, Chet or Wimby. I definitely said Wimby because – The potential is just out of this world when you look at the small things of Chet. And you have to understand that this is Chet's first year playing. But because he's been around an NBA team all of last year, he was able to pick up on things and have a little bit of a head start. Like diet and uh, weightlifting program and getting accustomed to the schedule and walkthroughs and NBA lifestyle. Vic is still catching up on that. He's going to have a, a year under his belt and we'll start to see some of those steps be taken um, during this year, but mainly next year and the year after. So I'm still on a on a long trajectory looking at Wimby and all of the things that he can do. They kind of scare me even on his down nights. He can record eight blocks or whatnot. Um, but Chet, Chet is Chet is a unicorn in himself. And I think he sets this team up to have um, a quicker a quicker route to success and in stepping into the light of being that young team. They're definitely giving me the Sacramento Kings vibes of last year, um, but maybe even better. This maybe could be a team that can have that type of year in advance of the second round because Shea is, we'll talk about Shea. I got to give him Shea his flowers. He's one of the players I'm giving flowers to this, 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 uh, this week, but we already know what he does. You know, it's, it's, it's damn near pointless to even bring him up. We know what he does and what, what he can do. And last year wasn't a fluke. Obviously, we see that. Um, and I just think that they had a good good job adding the proper collection of talent and needs with Isaiah Joe and his shooting, Lou Dort and his defense, Case and Wallace with his his ability to fit in and, and be valuable in any single way. Um, so I'm liking everything that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing from the Oklahoma city thunder. I just wanted to stop and give them some, some love for them and their fans. I want to give Chet some love because I know a lot of the talk is going to, uh, Wimby, you getting some Asar chatter and some of the other rookies who stand out, but man, Chet Holmgren is the real deal. And as of today, he's, he's, he's playing better than Chet. I mean, better than Wimby today. And the rookie of the year isn't a runaway anymore. I think as of right now, Chet may actually be running away with it. If we just being completely honest, things are slowing down out there in San Antonio. They're snowballing into a team that's going to be at the bottom of the conference again. When we first entered the season, they were actually winning games and being um, a competitive team. Now it's starting to show that there's still a little bit of weight. And Chet is um, he's killing it. And his team is, is up. Up and up. So I think Chet might be the leader for me right now, and he may be slowly running away with that award. But I just wanted to give them some love. I also want to give some love to the Kings. The Kings, six-game winning streak, they kind of started off slow. I'm not going to lie. I definitely predicted them to be a team that steps back a little bit from what they did last year. Um, Still not ruling that out. Still not ruling that out. I I, I don't think they will miss the playoffs. I never thought they would miss, miss the playoffs. But I definitely felt that they could potentially take a little step back from where they were last year. And I still think that. But a six-game winning streak has been incredible. 
Demontis Sabonis and uh, De'Aaron Fox are two names that are going to come up later. The, everybody over there has been hooping well. Malik Monk, Keegan Murray, Harrison Barnes. Um, so I'm loving what I'm seeing for them. Um, yeah, Spurs, eight-game losing streak. Blazers, seven-game losing streak. Pistons, 11-game losing streak. The thing that the Pistons bring to my attention is how we project teams. It's just strange to see the Pistons being this, playing this poorly and being this this bad because a lot of us is like, man, they could be one of those teams, how we looked at, how we see the Rockets. A lot of us thought, man, the Pistons potentially could be a Rockets team. Not yet. The Pistons could also have another tough year. That wasn't out of the question. But I, 11 games in a row this bad, this early, I didn't project for them. I couldn't predict that they would be like this. Um, this has been an incredibly tough stretch. They have some real issues that they have to iron out because it looks like Cade Cunningham doesn't have anybody around him that can really compliment him as an offensive threat. And it's it's leading up to him having some really bad performances. He's turning the ball over a lot. He's having to take a lot of tough shots. It's really like him against four uh, nightly on the offensive end. I don't know how they make those changes. Obviously, the Jaden Ivey situation, we still don't really know exactly what's going on over there. Um, if, he, you know, if there's really some some uh, some rumblings of him potentially exiting, um, obviously, you, you want to see Cade, him, um, Duran and Asar be able to, to, to exceed and take things off. But they have some real questions there and they have to really consider how they f- solidify that foundation because K Cunningham can't be the player that he can potentially be. If this is going to be some of the problems he's seeing, I think it's limiting him and his potential and you're going to have to interject some better fitting pieces, even if their potential isn't as high. So Jaden Ivey has high potential, right? But how effective is that potential if it's limiting your star? So this is where we talk about the less is more theory. Where with some previous draft picks and maybe even your next draft pick, you may have to substitute potential for fit. So this guy may not have MVP potential, but he's still a really good player. He's a young player and he fits next to Cade because all of that potential stuff don't even matter sometimes because it's like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, James Harden has MVP potential, but is he ever even going to reach his potential with Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant? No. So, okay, see, it didn't matter for them to care about his potential because it's like he's not even going to reach that. Can he fit here? Yeah. And James Harden was a case where he's able to fit next to those guys and came off the bench. And then when he left, he reached his MVP potential, which didn't really matter for OKC. So you're better off trying to find the fit anyway. Unless you just have this number one pick and he's just undeniable. And then you're like, oh, shit. Then you look at K like, hey, you might not be the face of the franchise. But as of right now, they need to figure out ways to compliment K Cunningham. But to me, when I see those type of situations, it's always just like, man, how are they so far from what a lot of us potentially thought they could do in the type of year that they could have? Like what 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 what's going on wrong there? Um and for it to get 11. I'm not saying that they can't lose games, but damn, 11 games. I can't remember the last time they won. <laughs> Honestly, I, I can't remember the last time they won. Um, same thing with the Blazers. The Blazers were, 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 were competent and they were competitive. And for them to quickly now shift into seven games, I know they don't have Anthony. I know they haven't had Scoot. But Shaden Sharp has had some moments. Uh, DeAndre Aiden had some stretches. And Jeremy Grant as well. So I still don't realize seven, seven is a lot. Like these teams are spiraling so bad that Memphis isn't the worst team in the West anymore. At a long time, like they they were legitimately the worst team in the NBA. Now they're not even the worst team out West, and they haven't even had a major change to anything. They're just the, the other teams are just losing so much. I think the Spurs are the worst team out West, um, and there's somebody else that's down there. Um, and I think Memphis is like 13th. They're like the third worst team out West. But you would think that they – how could somebody overleap them because they still haven't hit their, you know, their stride of being uh, close to what we potentially thought that they could be. Um, with all of the losing, all of the winning, trades, teams are starting to separate themselves. 
and with their trade rumors is, is heating up. This is my favorite part of the year. Um, I love that we're getting these type of situations earlier and earlier and not taking so much time to get to this point. But like I said, teams are starting to show the direction. We're starting to see clarity of who's who, where's where. There's still a bunch of middle of the pack teams that we don't really know because of the play in. And that's always going to be something that's going to hinder the trade market to its fullest capacity. Um, but I got I got a bunch of players or not. a I got a few players in front of me who I personally would like to see get traded. And I have a destination or two for each player. What I want you guys to do when you are hearing this or watching this, I want you to pause and I want you to put in some players that you would like to see and where you would like to see them go. And then after you unpause and you hear my players, I want you to add destinations potentially to each of the players I have. So we should have a lot of comments. Not only It's not only just to get a bunch of comments, but I really want to see where y'all heads at because this is something we can address in the next episode as well. Um, and I want to see what some of you guys think if you're fans of the teams that's trading the players and or of the teams that are receiving some of these players. So first player I have on my list is Jeremy Grant. Just talked about the Blazers. They're quickly spiraling into becoming one of the worst teams, um, not only in the West, but overall in the NBA. And I believe with his contract that he signed this past year, you can't trade him anyway till January 15th, along with a few other players that's on this list. But you'll have a chance eventually to trade him. And with this team falling down, um, there's really no need to keep a player like him. I think uh, he is past their timeline. And I think he is a guy who can be really, really valuable to a team that's trying to push and compete for a playoff spot and to play at a high level when they get around to the playoffs. So Jeremy Grant, the team that I have him lined up with is the Atlanta Hawks. You've probably heard me say it before. I just think this has been a seamless fit for these two teams oh, since ever since he left Denver, to be honest with you. When he left Denver and he went to Detroit, that was a time he could have went to Atlanta. Um, when he was getting traded from Detroit, that was a time for him to go to Atlanta. And even when his contract ran out from Portland um, last year before he resigned, that might have been a time for Atlanta. And I think now that he is signed and the Drill Blazers aren't good because they didn't bring Dane back and he's inevitably inevitably is going to get traded and now is the time for them to strike. And I think they have things that they they, they would like. They have a little they, they have some, you know, who doesn't love draft picks? You throw in a pick, maybe a second round pick, and I think a name like DeAndre Hunter plus his contract could get this deal done. I don't think it has to be a nine player trade. I don't think it has to be uh too um intricate or deep. I think this could be a fair thing where DeAndre Hunter can go to a change of scenery on a younger team and, and provide them with something that they're going to need down the line with some defensive upside on the wing. Um, he fits that timeline a little bit better because he is a little bit younger and he's a little bit cheaper and affordable. And I think um, Jeremy Grant is more seasoned and better right now to play a role that Atlanta needs where he can be extremely versatile on defense and offense and I think he's ready to be um, one of those top offensive options. I think you have DeJounte, you have Trey. Trey has his nights where he struggles. And they don't really have anybody outside of those guys on a consistent basis. And I think Jeremy Grant could be that consistent top option for them when, you know, they don't have one of their guys going. Or on nights when, man, whoever they're playing is able to match a Trey Young night. And now it's... But if you can have DeJounte, Trey, and Jeremy Grant on a nightly basis all doing their thing, that puts you in a different situation. And if they can make that trade without having to give up Jalen Johnson or A.J. Griffin or Kobe Bufkin, I think you jump on a situation like that. And Jeremy Grant, he just fits. I think he fits really well with Trey Young. Um, and just adding that athleticism and that length and that size defensively with DeJounte Murray. Um, and being able to get up and down and just having another leg legit scoring option that you can count on nightly, I think I think it uplifts them and propels them to be a, a much better team. Um, so I, I would love to see Jeremy Grant there. And like I said, on the flip side, DeAndre Hunter, um, he just projects better there because he's cheaper again and he's younger and he gives them something I think they're going to need for those young guys. Right now, you got Matisse Stiebel kind of playing that role. DeAndre Hunter can be a guy who can go there, grow, maybe take some steps, and play next to a Scoot, Anthony, 
and Shea and be some type of defensive, you know, uh, presence there on the perimeter as far as the youth uh, development goes. Um, another name on the list, Kyle Kuzma. Before we dive into where I want to see Kyle Kuzma, one of the things that's been interesting um, that I've seen with the Wizards is the conversation about Jordan Poole. It's like, hey, Jordan Poole may not be the guy that the Wizards, like, we don't know what they traded it for. They definitely traded because he has some upside. But it's like they may not necessarily feel obligated to have to sit and deal with some of the, some of the things that they're getting right now. If things don't turn around or if they don't see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, this is not a uh, for sure thing that they can keep. They can easily pivot and trade Jordan Poole is basically some of the chatter we've seen. We're like, don't rule that out. He could be traded again because of the contract being so um, large and enormous because it's looking really bad over there. And I felt like they always knew it was going to look bad. But because he isn't playing crazy good or actually is playing crazy bad, and it's just a lot of things that aren't glaring. And I think there, there's definitely some over uh, analyzing there because he's this is a new situation. Um, they still have a lot of basketball and a lot of different things to figure out. But I think it's just an interesting thing to to keep an eye on because I believe a lot of us thought it was a given. Like, oh, they ain't trading. They getting Jordan Poole. They moving on from Bradley Beal. This is going to be Jordan Poole team. He's going to be able to finally have his own situation. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. They're going to be, they, you know, they're not going to be good, but he's going to have a lot of great nights and it's going to be super exciting. They could be fun. It hasn't been fun. He hasn't had crazy great nights. He's had some plays here and there. Their fun and their excitement has come from watching uh, Bilal Kolobali do his thing on, on some nights and show his potential. But Jordan Poole hasn't had like these 40 and high 30 point nights and he's hitting these crazy shots and game winners and doing all these electric things that we saw with Golden State. And the Wizards now have to look at that as like, OK, if he's not going to be that guy or we projected a little bit too high for him. It ain't probably ain't worth to have him on his roster, holding every holding other young players back and investing this much of our salary into him in a role where he's not even growing. And, you know, he got a lot of money early. He got a lot of money early and I'm not ruling out him getting on track, but it's definitely going to be a, a, a some conversations being had if they don't see any growth or any of the things they expected to see this year. And so far. As we approach, you know, December, we're the, 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 the anyway, all I'm saying is that the, le- the the season is getting there. You know what I'm saying? We're about to start hitting points very soon where it's not the early phase of the year where you start. You have to start looking at things and saying, hey, that that might be what this is. This dude isn't just having a hot start. He might actually be onto something. This dude isn't just struggling for the first month. This might actually be a tough year for him. This team, you know, ain't on track. They may never get on track. So um, that's just another fold to the Kyle Kuzma thing that I found interesting. I know uh, my thumbnail bo- my thumbnail guy, Matt, was like, man, this is crazy. Whatever. I'm not ruling it out. I feel him. It's still early, and Jordan Poole could definitely be one of those players with the second half of the season. He's just phenomenal, and we see the vision, and we see the things that we projected, and it's like, okay. But if it's never, it's never getting to that stride, then I do think you have to start to sit back and say, man, not only what do we do, but who's going to be calling trying to acquire him in that contract? And how do you pivot if you're the Warriors? Because the way he does play and how he is programmed right now, um, it definitely it definitely limits others. You know what I'm saying? He definitely has a, a play style that is uh, that can be a little bit off the wall and detrimental to the team. And you allow it if it's showing growth. But if it's not showing growth and it's hindering others, what do you do and how do you convince somebody else to give you something of value while they take on that? So I definitely am watching that and not just looking like, man, y'all just talking. Uh, But I'm definitely on the side of Jordan Poole and giving him some time. But I'm definitely watching um, to see if there's any any points of them getting what they what they projected. Kyle Kuzma, though. Kyle Kuzma is kind of like Jeremy Grant, where I think he is in a situation where. He's able to obviously put up some good numbers, show some flashes, have some good nights. He's been uh, one of the consistent things for the Wizards. But I definitely think there is a better role for him on a championship team or a high-level playoff team. 
And that's why I would love to see him go to the Mavericks. Um, Kyle Kuzma reminds me a lot of a guy who played in the NBA for a long time, was a three slash four who could score, fill it up, but he can also play next to people. And that's Antoine Jameson. He reminds me a lot of Antoine Jameson. They have the same type type of build, same type of scorn um, portfolio or repertoire, and um, they can complement guys. And I think Kyle Kuzma, though he isn't some you know um, defensive lockdown guy that a lot of the Mavericks uh, fans may want, I think he will be a good option to fit next to Luka and Kyrie for scoring. And I think um, he could play. He could play with them. I think he could complement them, catch and shoot. Um, I think he'd have moments when they go on the bench. He could still be a bucket getter for you there. And um, I think when we saw him with the Lakers on a high level team, his defense was a lot better and a lot more engaged, and he was willing to do some things there. So I look at Cal Kuzma. And if there is a situation where the Mavericks can pull this off without giving up anything crazy. I am intrigued if they can do some draft capital stuff and then they can just take some contracts to make that money match and move on. And you can still keep Josh Green. You're still keeping um, Tim Hardaway Jr. I think I think you look to do do this move. If you can pivot away from Rashawn Holmes, um, if you can pivot away from Maxi Kleber and those type of things and. I would be interested to know if the Wizards would ask for Jaden Hardy. And Maverick fans, if you are listening, how do you feel about that? You're keeping Josh Green. You're keeping Tim Hardaway Jr. You're obviously keeping Derek Lively. But they're like, hey, at least give us Jaden Hardy. At least, at least give give us some draft capital. Give us Jaden Hardy. We'll take some of those contracts because Maxie isn't on a one year. He has three years left on that deal. Uh, Rashawn Holmes is a two-year deal. And there may be, be some, there may be somebody I'm forgetting that I could add for some money uh, flexibility. I don't know the white power they resign, so I don't I don't you know you can't give them three bigs and, and think that you're going to get Kyle Kuzma. But I would love to see Kyle Kuzma in a situation like that. I would love to see Kyle Kuzma on a um, Mavericks team. Hell, 76ers potentially, but I'm definitely liking the option of of. Uh, the Mavericks. I, th- I think that would be ideal for him. I think you get the best version of Kyle Kuzma because, yeah, it's cool to see him in Washington putting up numbers and having certain nights as the number one option. Uh, but it's not leading to anything. And he is a guy that's been on a championship team. He is a guy that can compliment guys like Luka LeBron. And he is also a guy that can have his own nights and be another threat of his own that another team has to worry about. So, um, I like the idea of potentially picturing Kyle Kuzma in a Mavericks uh, jersey with with uh, Luca and Kyrie. Um, my next guy is the, is the guy that's been all over the rumor mill, all over social media for a lot of different reasons. Him and the relationship of his current team it just is downhill, and the time is just ticking. Um, and that's Zach Levine. Zach Levine and the Chicago Bulls and that relationship looks like it is done, donezo. Um, and I think it's for the best, the best for them and the best for him. They can figure out their direction and exactly how they want to pivot into going into another rebuild, because I definitely hope that they don't think that they can just retool this. Um, and I do think with Zach Levine, the best thing for his career may be him being a third option on a really good team. Because if, if if he, hypothetically, if he goes to the Philadelphia 76ers, the team he's been linked to, that's Joel Embiid's team, then you have Maxi, and then you have Zach. Based off everything we've seen with the Bulls, Zach Levine is a good player, but him as your number one option does not, it does not do anything, cr- it, it doesn't propel you to be an elite team. It just doesn't. And I like Zach, I'm a fan of Zach, but that I think that ship has sailed of him being the number one on this really, really good high level team. And when you look around the NBA and you look at all of the top teams and the the type of hierarchy that they have, Zach Levine looks fitting as a third. You know what I'm saying? When you look at the Bucks and they got Giannis and Dame, LeBron and Anthony Davis, Jamal Murray, Jokic, um, you got Jalen Brown and Tatum and now Porzingis and Drew, like 
Zach Levine being your third makes it it's, it feels that feels right and better for a really really high level team like the 76ers. We I think that sounds way better than Zach Levine being your one or two. If Zach Levine is your one and two in this current state of the NBA, you're probably like, damn, you know, you could be, you better have some really, really good three fours and five. Like that starting five better be really, really, really damn good because that don't sound like a threat to some of the other teams. So um, I would love to see Zach Levine. I was like, I was kind of hesitant with Zach Levine going to the 76ers, but I'm like, hmm, maybe, yeah, maybe Zach as your third. You definitely still got to make sure you have some defense around him. Um, he's definitely a guy that I think will be a lot more prone to, to get into that stance and doing everything he has to do as a third option on a winning team and a winning environment, but you definitely still want more defense around him. Um, so I like him for the Philadelphia 76ers. Another situation that's extremely similar to that is the Lakers because you still have LeBron James, Anthony Davis. Uh, they're not going to give Austin Reeves for Zach. So you still even have Austin Reeves there. And then you have you add Zach. Zach obviously is the third there, but it's like that's that sounds a lot better again than just like you have Zach and Demar, Demar and Zach. That team doesn't sound as scary as when you hear Zach's name as a third guy. So um, those are just two spots that I would like to see Zach in. There's obviously a, a bunch of teams around the league that's going to have their interests, but I think those two teams put him in the ideal situation that I think could propel his career. Um, in the direction that he wants he wants to compete he wants to win he hasn't had much success um, in the winning department so far because he got drafted to the Timberwolves got traded to a rebuilding Bulls had a small taste of success then obviously injuries to Lonzo and things like that started to happen and now they're back into a situation that doesn't look very promising um, as of today so Lakers 76ers um, and teams and situations where Zach Levine could be the third name that you hear Obviously, there is certain nights where Zach Levine has a talent where he's going to be the first. He's going to have, you know, the first option numbers. But on a night by night basis, you go in and you're looking at him third on the scouting report instead of first. And he's getting the third defensive assignment instead of the first. He's seeing the second best perimeter defender instead of the first. So um, I like that for him and for the Bulls because it's time for them to, to, to change tides and go into an entirely different direction. So. Zach Levine. Um, another name to a lesser degree than all of the other names, Alec Burks. Alec Burks. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because the Pistons are on an 11-game losing streak. I think he's on the last year of his deal, making $10 million a year. Um, and there's every team that has playoff hopes or is going to make the playoffs can use um, a Alec Burks, a scoring punch off the bench. He's been absolutely phenomenal this year. Um, the Timberwolves could use that punch. The Pelicans, if they want to get into the mix, um, there's a, there's a countless amount of teams that I can name that could use Alec Burks and what he does um, off of the bench. And his, historically, he's he's been that name that um, a lot of teams have a liking to, to to come off the bench or start for a player that's been hurt out of your starting lineup. So um, Alec Burks, man, Alec Burks and the teams, I just put playoff teams. Playoff teams of hope, man. Playoff teams of hope. Somebody can make that $10 million match to go get him on that last year and use him to come off their bench and provide some type of scoring or even start on some nights where they got to rest the guy or uh, or have an injury they need to get to. The next guy is the same type of thing, but on the defensive end, and that's Alex Caruso. And I actually saw a trade where the Lakers got him and Zach. Lakers got Zach Levine and Alex Caruso, and the Bulls got back. Torian Prince, D'Angelo Russell, Rui Hachimura, Jalen Hunt Shafino, a 2028 first round pick, and I think some more draft capital. But man, if the Lakers were able to pull some shit like that off, well, now your starting lineup is what? Reeves, Levine, LeBron, Anthony Davis, and Jared Vanderbilt when he gets back healthy. And then you got Alex Caruso coming off the bench. Or if you want to play smaller until Caruso, I mean, until uh, Vanderbilt comes back, or e even if you, you know, you can start Christian Wood, bring Christian Wood off the bench, but you can also go uh, Caruso, Reeves, Levine, Braun at the four, Davis. That's a Laker hopeful trade. Laker fans around the world are all probably on their knees praying to God that that trade can somehow get through. The Bulls is my thing, though. The Bulls have been rumored to want um, a Drew Holiday type package for Alex Caruso. That sounds crazy, but I believe it because the Bulls are going to make sure 
that they get the proper value for him. He's not Drew Holiday, but Alex Caruso definitely changes the trajectory of any team he goes to, especially playoff teams like the Philadelphia 76ers, the Milwaukee Bucks, the Los Angeles Lakers, whatever team, the, the, the Suns. He would change a lot if he were able to go to one of those teams. So I do think the Lakers, I mean, the Bulls are going to want a King's ransom for him. Uh, but that is something that I'm going to pay attention to. And the last name I got on here is another wizard. Tyus Jones. Tyus Jones, last year of his deal, $14 million contract. I got him to the Spurs. I know his brother plays for them. And that's always a wonderful story where brothers can play together on the same team, Seth and Steph, or, you know, play against each other and whatnot. But when you talk about the Spurs and needing guard play to get the ball to Vic and to get them structured and having flow and pace and different things like that, Jeremy Sohan experiment, I, I get it, understand it, nothing wrong with it. But Tyus Jones could really get this team going and, and structured. And because of what is going on with Washington and playing with Jordan Poole and Kuzma, you don't see the same effect of Tyus Jones. And you don't really see his value and what he brings to the basketball court because that's an entirely different situation that doesn't show his strengths. So I think a team like the Spurs could really use him and what he is good at, which is organizing the floor, being a floor general, and providing some of those things that they lack right now. So I would love to see him on the last year of his deal, not necessarily go to a playoff te playoff team. Obviously, that's a, a situation and an option as well. But a young team like the Spurs could use what he does, and I think that would that would put them in a much better situation um, going forward to wrap up the year. Are they going to be a playoff team? Probably not, but you'll get a lot more consistency from Vic, from Vassell, Keldon Johnson. A lot of things would, would have a, uh, some more structure to to get those guys right down the line. Um, but, yeah, those are my names. Uh, that's one, two, three, four, five. That's six names. I know there's a bunch of other names that y'all will probably put in the comments and have out there to to fit this. So, again, y'all let me know what y'all thinking and some of the names that y'all will have and some other destinations for these guys that I mentioned. Um, before we get into our flowers and our reproach to wrap up, want to talk about Russell Westbrook and the Clippers. They were able to get their first win after uh, – that, that little losing streak after acquiring James Harden, Russell Westbrook offers to come off the bench. A lot of players, um, a lot of people giving Russ his flowers for that. I want to be another one that give Russ his flowers. We did have some haters. Man, that's just PR. You think that Russ really said he wanted to come off the bench? They just saying that they he was always the odd man now and all of these different things. I'm going to give Russ his flowers. And the reason I'm, I'm br even bringing this up and giving Russ his flowers is because I think this is what players should start realizing. There is guys like Russ and Chris Paul who coming off the bench and just doing what they have to do. That is adding three, four, five years to your career. We have the information and examples of seeing guys who are past their prime but are able to extend their career because of this type of thinking and this type of buying in and this type of level of acceptance of okay i ain't the same player but i'm still a productive player who can produce and help a team and i'm also going to be helpful by being able to be on board with anything that is concerned around winning my goal is to win so anything the team and the coach needs for me to win i'm going to do and buy into there's other examples of people not buying in and their career got cut short and there's a lot of guys sitting at home on a couch wishing they was a part of a team that still have a lot of basketball left in the tank, but they weren't willing to buy in in their last few places. So when I look around and I see this stuff going on with James Harden, I'm, I'm seeing things that we talked about earlier with Klay Thompson. I'm looking at the exit Mellow had. I'm looking at the Marcus Cousins and John Wall not being on teams. And it's like. These are the examples that players need for when that time comes, because it is going to come. And we just have too many guys not being able to reprogram themselves into accepting the state of their career and buying in. We got guys who are past their prime and past their star status still trying to be the star and have star type um, star type of roles and, and, and responsibilities. And we see the career span get get chopped a little bit. And I think this extends your career when you take a page out of the Chris Paul or Russell Westbrook book. So I want to give Chris Paul, I mean, Chris Paul and Russell Westbrook their flowers for buying in and potentially helping their teams in the long run. Uh, 
Clippers, y'all got a winner. Y'all got a win on the road. C- congrats for beating the, the the Rockets, who are winless on the road. The Rockets have not won a game on the road yet. They lost there. They lost in L.A. Now they about to have to play the Warriors tonight. So I ain't I can't give y'all too much of a round of applause. I'm just glad y'all got that monkey off the back. But y'all have to go out and win a road game as well because I have here 0-6 on the road. Unacceptable for a team that's trying to make the playoffs and do damage in the playoffs. Um, now, flowers and reproach. Always what we do to wrap up. We got to give our flowers over the week and guys that we wanted to see more from. We'll start with the reproach. Shaden Sharp, tough, tough week for Shaden Sharp, a guy that I've spoke highly about um, for a while now. 13 points, 7 rebounds, 4 assists over this past week. Shooting 30% from the field, 24% from three, 79% from uh, the free throw line, 3.5 turnovers. Right? So he's he's almost has a 1-on-1 assist to turnover ratio. He had a bad, bad game with 10 turnovers. They're going to need Shaden Sharp to, to not play like this. Because I, I, uh, I have a feeling he could be the best player on that team. I think his upside and his potential is that is that high, where he could be better than Simons, he could be better than Scoot, he could be the guy over there. So I want to, I want, I know he's young. Things like this is gonna happen. Stretches like this is gonna happen. Um, but I, I, I want to see him get to a point where we don't have weeks that look like this, uh, because he's a lot, he's a lot better than that. So um, next guy we have is Jordan Poole. Jordan Poole, another tough week, man. We can't ex- express it enough. Thirteen points. Four rebounds, five assists, 32% from the field, 21% from three, um, 100% from the free throw line, five turnovers a game. Five turnovers a game. Five assists, but also five turnovers. Um, the shot attempts, shot diet has to change. This is going to be another year of development. I keep saying it. But even with that, with this being a year of development, he has to be better. He has to be better, man. This isn't the same situation from, from these previous years where he's a young buck. He, he's one of the names now that people are coming to see when they watch the Wizards and people are counting on him to perform a lot better. 13 points is not enough for a $32 million man who has his own team now. A um, couple other names. Vic, the first time you hear Vic on here, uh, Vic has gotten a lot of love and praise and hype out of, out of this, this season. But this past week was tough. 18 points, 12 rebounds, um, two assists, which is why I tell people this guy is very scary. 3.3 blocks as well on a re- on a week where we're criticizing him. Those were his numbers, 18, 12, and three blocks. This is why he's scary, ladies and gentlemen. 38% from the field, never should be happening. Never should be that low. 23% from the uh, three-point line, 86% from the free throw line, and four turnovers. Two assists per game, and you average four turn- turnovers, unacceptable. 38% from the field, unacceptable for a 7-4 guy. I don't give a damn how skinny you are and how much weight and strength you need to continue to add. 38% unacceptable. Unacceptable. But the pro is the fact that this dude can give you 18 and 12 on a quote unquote down week. <laughs> That's scary. That's scary. Um, and last but not least, Jabari Smith Jr., 11 points per game, six rebounds, zero assists, 41% from the field, 30% from three, 100% from the free throw line, but he's only shooting one attempt per game. And those 11 points are coming on 11 shot attempts. Definitely want to see him shoot the ball better. Um, but I love his approach. I love his mindset. They asked him about not closing out games. His quote was, hey, we're winning because they was on a win streak when this was happening. We're winning, and that's what Jeff Green is here for. I'm still young. He's the vet. I'm able to watch him and see what he's doing and why he's out there, and I can learn from that. Great answer, Jabari. I think that's why your future is bright. I think that's why Houston's future is bright, and I think that's why it's important to remember veteran presence is important and it does have a role in the NBA and the Rockets are showing us that because this young team is ahead of schedule and um, they're growing and learning and playing better game by game by game. And I think it's starting to feel like they could have a legitimate chance at being a playoff team. So um, shout out to all of those guys. Just just to reproach guys who have some tough weeks that we want to see turning around guys that we are all confident will turn it around as fast as this upcoming week because that's how talented they are. Now, as far as flowers, before we get up out of here, real quick, De'Aaron Fox. De'Aaron Fox and the Kings, six-game winning streak. We gave us some love earlier. De'Aaron Fox came back from his injury, uh, 32 points per game, five rebounds, six assists, two steals, shooting 52% from the field, 44% from three, 72% from the free throw line, and continue to be a very clutch player. He's looking like he's hitting another stride. 
um, in his career and hitting another level. So shout out to De'Aaron Fox. Shout out to the Sacramento Kings. Love the way that they play basketball and love. I just love De'Aaron Fox's attitude and his his will, his will to win and how much he's grown as an NBA player since he came in from day one. Um, Malik Beasley, Malik Beasley, the Bucks are getting things going. They're quietly rolling. I think they're on a four game winning streak. They had a really, really good week. Malik Beasley this week averaged 13 points, three rebounds. I mean, uh, 16 points, three rebounds. He shot 75% from the field, 50% from three. Six, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He shot 58% from the field, 40, 54% from the uh, three point line. He shot 0% from the free throw line. I, my, my, I, I don't know if I just read that wrong. 58% from the field, 54% from the three point line, 0% from the free throw line. I apologize. Shit. Malik Beasley, good week, man. Now, the guy who I was reading accidentally, Sabonis. Sabonis, 28 28 points per per game, 13 rebounds, 7 assists, 75% from the field, 50% from three, 68% from the free throw line. Sabonis, have yourself a week. Have yourself a week. And Malik Beasley, we ain't forget that you got in that stands and let that dude go right around you. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. Um, also, Shea. Shea, 30 points per game, four rebounds, five assists, three steals, 56% from the, from the field, 30, 47% from the three-point line, 100% at the free throw strike. Shea, incredible. They're rolling. They're they're rocking. Love to see that from him. And then our last two guys, some old guys, man, some, some old fellas. LeBron, 29 points per game, seven rebounds, eight assists, 63% from the field, 48% from three, 76% at the charity strike. Love to see the old man, Uncle Bron, putting up big monsters numbers for the Lakers. I think they had an undefeated week 3-0. and So shout out to LeBron. And then last but not least, KD, Kevin Durant, man. Holy shit. Uh, video game numbers, 36 points per game, 7 rebounds, 8 assists, 62% from the field, 63% from 3, 100% from the free throw line. They had an undefeated, undefeated week. Um, phenomenal. Phenomenal. Don't take these guys for granted. The years that we have of them aren't necessarily a given. This is the last stretch of their careers, and they're still playing like that at a high elite level. And we got a couple of chances to see them go against each other. So appreciate that. Um, another week of the Heliocentric Podcast. I appreciate y'all. Another hour episode. We here. Thank you to everybody who tuned in and watched. Um, that's showing love. Got us. Got us going in a proper direction. I love doing this. I love seeing y'all feedback. I'm super appreciative. I want everybody to have a happy holiday with their family um, as we get closer and closer to Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year. Let's end this year on a very extremely high note. Love to everybody. Safe travels to everybody that's on the road, going to different places. Enjoy y'all food. Um, eat a bunch of eat a bunch of turkey, ham, whatever you love. And also, yeah, let us let me know your fa- y'all favorite Thanksgiving foods. That's always a hot topic. So I appreciate y'all. Another episode of Heliocentric. I'll see y'all next week. I'm out. I love y'all. Peace.